everybody, this is Nathalie. I'm your host on the Natural Beekeeping Corner for the Hive Jive. And today I have a very special guest, uh, somebody that I really uh, love for what she does and her passion in her work with the bees and other areas of her farm. And it's Fanta Molino. So Fanta, welcome to the Hive Jive and the Natural Beekeeping Corner. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I love this podcast. Thank you so much for being here. So tell us a little bit of a quick introduction on what you do and, and your beekeeping style, and then we'll get into questions and answers. Oh, great. Okay. Well, um, I'm primarily um, a homestead and it's called Wild Everlasting Farm and it's in the Pacific Northwest of Oregon. And we have 30 acres on the river. Um, and we, like our little mission statement is 30 acres devoted to exploring the kinship between people, plants, and pollinators. Oh. And we do that by extensive um, uh, forage plantings for bees, which also happen to um, meet our requirement as people because they're often medicinal herbs or food crops. Um, which we have a farm stand um, that is open all summer long and we sell our crafts there. I'm also a master herbalist. And so for um, about the past 20 years, that's mostly what I've been spending um, my life work, um, working towards is uh, building up a beautiful apothecary and farm with all my, all my favorite plants and friends. Um, and beekeeping sort of came as an extension to that. And now, um, I have over 40 hives and I raise um, around 30 nukes um, and for sale to my community from a seasonal queen rearing project that I do every year um, because I'm very passionate about um, creating local bioregionally adapted queens and bees for my community because the difference between something you buy coming out of um, the industry versus something you can rear in your area is just, it's a chasm between the differences. Um, and then about five years ago, I started a school, a Sun Queen School of Apiary Arts. And I just really wanted to share with people um, a more unique perspective in beekeeping that takes into account um, nature, your bioregion, plants, and all these sort of um, important aspects of beekeeping that inform our practices that are so often left out of the conversation. And so uh, that's been going, this is our fifth year. Um, we have a full program and it's been so wonderful. Um, and then, of course, I do public speaking at all the different clubs around, and I am really grateful to you for extending to me always um, some wonderful opportunities to uh, speak to the public about my work, and it really has been a wonderful uh, joy in my life to have met so many beautiful people through bees, so... This is so awesome. And this is why you're here today, because um, uh, what was it, two, two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. I met you via a Facebook group and we had you over for the World Bee Day webinar. And I haven't looked back since. I always get goosebumps <laughs> when you present. And uh, for those of you who are interested, Fanta was the uh, guest speaker on the 2020 and 2021 World Bee Day a natural beekeeping webinar. So if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to go and, and find the tickets for uh, some of this stuff and, and just just kind of um, uh, look and see um, some of those recordings that we have. Fanta is fantastic and she's amazing and I really enjoy her philosophy and her way to build community um, so that we've got um, a good understanding of uh, the relationship between the bees, the plants, and the bioregions uh, as they work. So today you have a special uh, topic I wanted to ask you about what you uh what are you, specific re uh, recommendations you may have concerning brood dynamics and things how how to optimize your beekeeping in a way your natural beekeeping in a way that's going to allow you to be successful based on the region that you're in and what you're looking into your brood's nest so uh tell me a little bit about your concept about brood dynamics and what you uh were referring to earlier uh, before we got started yeah. Okay, great. Well, this is really the crux of um, all of my teaching and my curriculum was sort of this kind of aha moment I had 
when really understanding um, when you look into your hive and you're a beginner beekeeping uh, or, or you're a beginner beekeeper, it can be very overwhelming because there's so, I mean, the body of knowledge of beekeeping is so vast and it's very diverse. So there's many ways to skin this cat, right? And if you ask, you know, the whole old adage, like if you ask anybody, you know, 10 beekeepers, you're going to get 11 opinions, you know, and it's really true. Everyone has their own way. Um, but ultimately, there is sort of a universal thread that runs through it all. And that is that the bees are always in communion with nature, the weather, and the plants that are their food sources, um, as are we, but we often uh, forget our place in the uh, web of life. And because we are so closely kin with bees and pollinators in general, much of the things that um, are we our experience of food and weather and all these things that are affecting us are also affecting our bees. And so my, my real goal with my students is to teach um, instinctual beekeeping. It's this idea that you don't have to look and check the calendar or ask, you know, everybody else or check the book about what you're supposed to do, that you're sort of looking into your brood nest with through the lens of your bioregion and the weather that you're experiencing, not only over a season, but real time weather um, and how that can affect the brood nest. Um, and in general, we're all sort of following um, the ancient wheel of the year. And the wheel of the year is a cross-cultural um, circular calendar that has always been used in agrarian society to teach um, sort of and, and bring yourself into the process of the season and sort of what to do when. Um, and it's really helpful in beekeeping because bees are very much structured along this calendar. And so for the Northern hemisphere, um, this shifts a little bit the closer you are to the equator, obviously. Um, but in general, we um, our beekeeping year begins in spring equinox and um, starts to kind of uh, finish up at fall equinox. And so it's relatively a short amount of time that we do pretty much all of our beekeeping. Mm -hmm. And so with that context in mind, we see that summer solstice is the climax between those two points. And so it helps us divide the year into two even parts, which is the increase season and the decrease season. And what's interesting is this is what is so tricky for new beekeepers is all the advice that they've been given for the increase part of the year. Um, for instance, you know, add in a new box when, you know, bees are on 70% of the, um, you know, tops of the frames or um, add in new bars, you know, every other, um, you know, checkerboard in new bars to your top bar, you know, uh, whenever you see that they need one kind of a thing. And so there's, you know, all these sort of rules of thumb. However, if you do those same things in the decrease season after summer solstice, you're not going to have the same results because whether you can see it in your hive or not, the weather, the plants, everything is, is already in preparation for winter. So that brood nest, which was expanding, expanding, increasing, increasing, is now going to be in decreasing mode. And they're going to be backfilling the upper reaches of the brood nest and filling it with honey and sort of getting um, set to um, align themselves with winter. And so this is what is so confusing for folks is because they, you know, start adding in bars into the brood nest during um, decrease season, and that can be really hard on the brood, or that can um, create gaps, which is not something that you want. You want them to be very tight and clustery going into winter and have everything they need right then and there. And so if you're giving them too much room, it diffuses the cluster. And what they're trying to do is constrict it back. And so it's a lot of it is, you know, about that sort of, you know, expansion contraction and working with that. It's like um, uh, stretching the animal 
to its limit. Right. Putting it, you know, the combs are kind of like the ribs of the animal. So if we put empty space between the ribs, we're just really stretching it out to a level that's stressful to them. So I always tell our students the same similar things, actually. And we say, if you're going to add bars, you put it at the edge of the bird's nest or maybe like a right. third into the bird's nest, but not in the center. And you don't do it too much at the time and you follow the expansion. And as mm -hmm. soon as that expansion slows down and comes to a halt, you don't do that anymore because obviously they're not going to build when there's no nectar flow. They're not going to add more combs. So what you're doing is you're putting empty space and it's never going to get filled. And to your point, when they're decreasing and going into winter, it becomes very and efficient for them to keep the cluster warm and 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 um, healthy when there's too much dead air, dead space in the middle of things. It's kind of like you can't keep warm if everybody's standing on the end of the cor uh, one corner of the room. If you huddle together, then you're going to be warm. So that's very damaging. And I, I, I mean, that's great advice right there. So thank you for sharing that. What yeah. else can you tell us? Well, you know, um, the other aspect is um, thinking about when, you know, you're in that brood nest. That is a very vulnerable space for these bees. All of their young and babies are there. And, you know, if you can imagine any uh, stranger putting hands on your babies, how you would feel. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's really important to um, honor that um, vulnerability while you're in that space. And Expecting all of it. the hives, you know, are designed um, to sort of um, work with the bee's natural instincts. And so in a Langstroth hive, you have tabs that are on each, um, and we like to call them at my school dog ears, because if you look yeah. down at the frame, it looks like little puppy ears hanging off and the nails are the eyes. <laughs> oh, that's so that's cute. a really good little method. And the whole point of the Langstroth hive is that those uh, frames are all pushed up together at all times. Mm -hmm. And those tabs are all connected. And what that happens when they all are connected is that the whole hive will maintain bee space and you won't create unnecessary contact points where bees can get smushed, basically. In a top bar hive, the length of the bar is all... Um, meant to be, you know, all the bars are meant to be held together like that. And so when you're pulling bars, you're, you kind of want to move a buffer up so that you're not having lots of bars open, right? Because then when you go to put things back, they're all going to get smushed in between those bars. And so it's really important to me when I'm maintaining any of my hives that I'm being respectful of that vulnerability and the contact points. And I often will have students say, you know, uh, I need you to come out and, you know, I do a lot of mentoring in people's hives. And they'll say, I've, I think I need to requeen. I have a hot, you know, queen. I have hot bees. And nine times out of 10, they just haven't developed um, positive um, exactly. skills for tending their hives, right? And so when they're in there, they're creating lots of contact points and they're smashing lots of bees. And a lot of times you're not seeing yeah. it, right? <laughs> because they're just pushing things back and they're done, put the lid on, you know? <laughs> it's, it's like- very casual sometimes and, and so, somewhat bordering disrespect of the sanctity of the bird's nest, basically. Right, and that's um, something that I think is so important. And if you think about bees as a creature, um, you know, their clustering instinct, that, that idea of the cluster and, and the swarm and all these things, it's very indicative of, of who they are. And that process um, cultivates uh, well-being and um, uh, honors their life processes. And so this idea of diffusing it too much in the increased time of year, you can play with that a little more heavily than you could. But that's not to say always. Like for instance, here right now in the Pacific Northwest, we have had the coldest spring, coldest, wettest spring on record. We had temperatures in April that went down to 19 degrees, which oh, wow. we never have. And so a people who kind of do things by the book, what they do, they put a bunch of supers on early on, they added a bunch of frames, they made splits, right? And so the temps were so cold that these poor bees, I went into someone's hives um, yesterday and the queen was all the way up in this empty super that had just all naked frames and they'd built cross combs in like four different 
areas and there was she had laid in all of those and below was just all the resources everything but because heat rises right. the whole cluster wanted to move up to that top box right. there was no comb for her to lay in you know so we have to be in real time as well it's not like oh well I did this last year so it's okay to do this this year you have to view it through the lens of your actual real-time weather and what's happening in the area and think about how their biology would react to those things. Um, the other problem was is that because all that cold air um, at cold weather we had, all the fruit trees were in bloom. And so they all just got trashed. So we oh, have yeah. basically had nothing for you know that real big early spring flow and so it was different than not only last year but the last five years and so we have to be able to pivot and turn and respond this is what right. in, intuitive beekeeping is is understanding so much about the creature and understanding so much about the bioregion that you're able to respond accordingly well, that's critical because too often people are wanting to follow a recipe. They're asking, when do you do this? How much do you do this? And, and a recipe or a book or even a calendar, to your point, is not going to work. You have to be in tune with what the environment is doing. Bees are intimately linked to the cycles of weather and forage. The length of the day and, and the amount of pollen coming into the hive will take dictate when they get started on brew rearing. And yeah. there's no recipe for that. So if we don't kind of um, get that instinct developed, which comes with practice, which comes yeah. with being attentive, uh, mm -hmm. listening to um, the hive, watching what's going on inside and outside of the hive, understanding the botany of the plants in your bioregion, you're not going to be successful necessarily. You might, you know, um, a bump into success just by chance, That's right. but it's not going to be necessarily repeatable. And it's only right. because the bees are very resilient. And That's if you right. don't respect the cycles of expansion and contractions, if you don't respect the sanctity of the brood's nest, and if you don't don't respect the, the 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 way the honeybee as a superorganism is functioning. You're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a repeatable success kind of a thing. Right. It's it's, it's, it's going to be an extended accidental success instead of repeatable success. So tuning into the nature of the bees. Les talks about that. Les Crowder talks about that as well. This is yes. what we focus as well on. And you're right on, Fanta. This is what. Uh, our listeners need to really understand if they want to be successful at beekeeping in general, but especially it's especially more important for natural beekeeping yes. because it requires um, more finesse. It requires mm -hmm. more understanding of the, the, the biology of the honeybee yeah. and it requires more um, potentially not, not necessarily interventions, but just kind of like um, nudging and caring and just right. kind of observing what's happening so that you can intervene in a timely fashion um, and just not uh, wait for catastrophe to happen. So I really, I mean, this is, this is amazingly informative. So it's, and it's right up there with what Les Crowder and I talk about. And it, and it is def the definition of um, natural beekeeping. I think you're right, is the instinctive beekeeping mm -hmm. and being in tune with the, the organism and I always say it's kind of like playing chess with your mm -hmm. mind. You have so many parameters. You have to be so observant. You have to keep it all in your head. <laughs> and then just kind of come up with, uh, you know, what you, the diagnosis of what's happening and how mm -hmm. you can um, act on, on that based on your goals. Some people don't want to, you know, do much with their bees. They're not looking for honey. They're not looking for a, a lot of production. Some people are. So, and you can do that in the context of natural beekeeping. You can produce a whole lot of um, honey oh, in the context of natural we beekeeping. We sure do. We sure do. Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with healthy natural um, uh, circumstances that follow the bee biology, the bees are going to be healthier and they're going to produce more, oh. more bees, more food. Absolutely. I, that was something that I hear a lot where people kind of have this idea about, oh, well, you know, you can't produce enough or you can't, you know, um, if you do things like this, you know, they think that we have strayed from production and I, I completely disagree. Left. 
foundationless. Do you keep with, with foundation or foundationless? I mean, there's a big argument that you're going to produce more honey on foundation versus foundationless. Oh yeah. You know, it's all about the drawn comb, you yeah. know, we all know that that's our prize and our treasure. And um, I work really hard to preserve it and always keep it in good condition. Um, but that being said, you know, I also keep top bars and worries, which we're constantly culling out the old comb. And I think there's um, amazing things to be said about that because we know that comb can vector virus and right. um, disease. So, you know, it's, it's really for me, one of the most important things for me in beekeeping is to not join a camp. And that's what I love about the term natural beekeeping. It applies that we are working with nature as our main informant, right? And we are sort of, like you said, we're detectives when we're in there. Right. We're doing sort of bee forensics and we're kind of, you know, in there. And um, for me, it's really important to kind of understand that I want to stay um, in the place of a student. I'm a student of the mm -hmm. bees and they are, um, I work with a, beekeeper at my club and he's 90 years old and he said there's never been he's been beekeeping since he was 15 and there's wow. never been a season in beekeeping where his whole mind hasn't been blown about everything <laughs> he thought he knew before and I think it's so important to stay open to the lessons that they have to show and teach us and um, that does create sustainability and health and well-being um, and about the natural aspect of it, I think that's really uh, um, an important designation because um, one thing is, is we sometimes have this idea of humans outside of nature, right? Yes. And this is a false um, understanding because humans are a part of nature mm -hmm. and we are nature. And a lot of things we do culturally are not natural. And so in some ways, what we're doing is we're honoring um, the nature of who we really are right? And also the human honeybee connection. And the human honeybee connection is not watching nature do its own thing, right? Mm -hmm. The human honeybee connection, beekeeping, is the honoring of two biological organisms coming together in a dynamic relationship and connect. collaborating for a goal that is much higher potential than either one of our singular interests. Mm -hmm. So I'm not interested in rewilding the honeybee because I'm working to collaborate with the honeybee. And so the work that we can do together through our collaboration and our manipulations and the cultural um, processes, that all is reciprocity. And so we've already diverted from nature when we put bees in any kind of wooden box, okay? They're in captivity, straight up. And the reality is, yes, they can fly out and they can choose to swarm, but ultimately when they lay egg number one, <laughs> they're in that spot, right? And so we owe them our reciprocity. And so even if you're a hands-off beekeeper, um, and to me, I'm not as interested in that. I want to work with my bees. If I felt like I really wanted to let them do their own thing, I would let them just be in the trees and plant tons of forage crops for them. That's how we save the bees. So our beekeeping practice practices is to step beyond our natural natures of, you know, going our own way with our own biological interests and collaborating those together. And we do our manipulations um, and the things that we do when we get in the hive, we're using our human intelligence, our amazing opposable fingers, right. and we're, we can help them. We can work with their biology. And at the same time, they're helping us. They're increasing the um, productivity of our gardens. They're offering the most pure medicinal food in the world. They're giving us the purest beeswax that could ever be found. So this is, this is a reciprocity between two organisms. And so it's hard for me when people say, oh, I just let them do their own thing. You know, it, it's sort of for me, it's like, you know, that they still deserve your reciprocity. I still want to see you getting in there and cleaning out the bottom of your hive. Mm -hmm. I still want to see you providing some aspect other than just pulling a box of honey once a year, right? Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's really um, natural beekeeping is the pinnacle of the human honeybee connection and what we can do when we collaborate. So. Mm -hmm.
I get goosebumps. This is exactly right. So I, I think that there's a couple uh, key words here that I want to uh, circle back on. Uh, you're talking about collaboration, and it's it's definitely what it is. We are basically the it's good husbandry to kind of uh, take good care of the livestock in a way or the the animal that's under our care. So if we're going to put them in those boxes, then you're right. We shouldn't neglect them and let them just kind of like not do well in a context that's not necessarily what they would have chosen right. otherwise and that's not necessarily adapted to their needs and the lack of insulation or or the um um the way that they can build out in those hives so right. we owe it to them to to fulfill that our part of that collaboration and just kind of be uh, uh doing good husbandry and just kind of manage them in a way that's going to help them without uh, being disrespectful, uh, we can do that in a very respectful way. We can be humble about it, not think that we know better than the bees and we can impose our will on them because whenever we do that, we're actually being very counterproductive and we hurt the animal, which mm -hmm. is not going to, I mean, to the collaboration point, if we want them to flourish and produce for ourselves, we need to do everything we can mm -hmm. for them to be healthy and, and um, able to fulfill their mission in life. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to say it, it doesn't mean pouring pesticides in there because we think that's the silver bullet that's going to solve the issue. That's right. To circle back to your initial point, the nukes that you're selling are local survivor stock. They're adapted to your bioregion, to the local cycles of weather and forage. And those are the bees that are going to do the best. And they're going to do that naturally. And they don't need any kind of pesticides in there. They're already the best prepared to fulfill their mission. Uh, and, and much more than any commercial bees you're going to buy, any treated bees that you're going to buy, even any commercially bred queens that have been That's grafted, right. which is not the natural process. So mm -hmm. whenever you can, try to find, you know, local bees, either through swarm trapping, swarm catching, um, potentially bees that you may have, let them requeen themselves. They're going to start mating with local drones. And after a couple of iterations of that, you're going to end up with much more rich, much more um, vibrant genetics in your colonies that are going to be best adapted to your plants and botany and the weather and all this stuff. So yeah, yeah that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, I think that we're not always humble enough in the face of the organism when we're trying to impose our will i hear a lot of people that are telling me well men has the dominion on the colonies of bees and they should dis yeah i've heard that before and and they should they, they they need to do what they want so that you know it fulfills their goals the beekeepers goals well but it's short-sighted because in the long run it's not going to make for healthy colonies mm. No. So in the end, having the symbiotic relationship that you're talking about, that collaboration is going to make for the best and, and healthiest colonies. And in the end, the beekeeper is going to get that part of the collaboration and be successful in turn. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's a lot of really good um, advice so far. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about, about bird dynamics that's going to help our listeners be successful? There was a lot already to. to yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, one of the things that's so interesting is that when we do align our practices with the weather, with the nature, all the things that we've discussed, we come into our collaboration with much more to bring to our bees, right? Because they already know a lot about us. They have thousands of years of evolution with us. And they wouldn't be developing honey and wax and all these things that humans really do and pollination that does, you know, give to us as an organism on such a high level if they didn't really know us. And so I think that's interesting to come to your point about being humble is we have a, we've barely scratched the surface, even right. the best beekeepers that know everything Absolutely. have barely scratched the surface on what there is to know about bees. And so for me, a lot of it is that sort of like, um, you know, wonder of nature that is so beautiful about this relationship and being willing to change your, what you thought was right about something or something that really worked for you in the past, realizing it wasn't going to work now and being willing to shift gears and work with the organism. And, um, 
in relationship to raising your own bioregional queens, I think that that is sort of the direction the bees want us to go. Right. Because we know that they've, in the 50s, they concentrated down the gene pool to a very small uh, gene pool, right? And that's never good for any organism. All organisms are seeking biodiversity. That's the goal of all nature. And so when you cut down on biodiversity, that is against the will of nature. Mm -hmm. And so bringing back biodiversity is so beautiful. And so kind of to hit both these points in the past, I always have had my one queen rearing method. This is what I do. And I do uh, frame-based queen rearing because I want to use the skills of the bees to choose the best queen cells, right? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes we're judging by wax. We're judging by the size. We're judging, you know, we have all these sort they of have no ideas. Clue. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the same time is I've done grafting. I've done all the types of queen rearing. And for me, ultimately, um, the grafting produces too many queens at one time from one specific stock. So mm -hmm. it concentrates the genetics again, right? So you build all this diverse genetics, but then you rear off of one queen and make a ton of queens. You've now consolidated genetics again, right? And mm -hmm. this is why people can't hold on to their genetics over time. Right. You draw a Punnett square on, I raise goats, okay? You draw a Punnett square on goats, it's like tic-tac-toe. You draw, <laughs> draw a Punnett square on bees, it's like graph paper. <laughs> so it's very hard to line breed bees. And this is why if they were able to breed it out of bees, they would have done so, you know, already the problems with virus and mites and things like right. that. So the importance is having lots of biodiversity. That's what creates the um, opportunity for good genetics. And so this year we have this crazy cold weather and, you know, I'm getting ready to do my same old method. And that method requires me to build a cell builder, then, you know, push them to make a bunch of queens. And then I take those queens and I, you know, deal them all out into mating nukes basically. Mm -hmm. And that those nukes are very small and vulnerable until that queen gets mated. Mm -hmm. And with these temperatures, that was just not going to work, you mm -hmm. know? And so all of a sudden I'm lucky enough because I'm taking the queen rearing um, school with Ange Roel. Oh, she's going to be on the World Bee Day Natural Beekeeping webinar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's they exactly. are amazing. And they brought so much um, knowledge to the table with this um, work that they've been doing to produce the queen rearing guide. And in there, they outline a method called the runaway split. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it seems sort of like an obtuse tool <laughs> because I do all these other queen rearing styles. I'm kind of like, eh, I don't think I'm going to do that ever. I don't really, I like to get more resources out of what I'm doing. Um, but then I was listening to them talk about biodiversity and I realized it was like an aha moment where if I'm creating lots of queens from one hive, even if um, she's my best queen and I love her. I'm again concentrating genetics and I'm Keeping not over and over allowing. Again. Yes. Right. And so this runaway split method, although it's sort of obtuse because you're not going to create as many splits off of one hive as I can with my other method, it's genius because it creates lots of biodiversity. Because mm -hmm. then I've got all these queens that have overwintered. Mm -hmm. I'm able to um explore all these different genetic lines mm -hmm. by having lots of different queen lines going rather mm -hmm. than just one. And right. so it was so cool too, because it requires moving the whole hive and then putting the nuke back in the original place. And then all the foragers fill up that little baby nuke that needs right. to get made. And strengthen and it so, really naturally. You know, and then for the cold temperatures, they were huge nukes. And mm -hmm. so they were totally able to keep themselves warm. And so it was sort of this idea of humbling myself and from what I thought and knew was right to be able to go with this method that seems sort of like, you know, not as fine tuned as my method because right. it fit all the these other circumstances, right? right? And so it really just um, 
it was just a, for me, an aha moment of, you know, working with that biodiversity, working with the will of the creature and the will of nature to want to bring about lots more possibility. And so I just really, it was really exciting for me to get to kind of see that in my beekeeping and go, okay, we can all get kind of stuck on our little ways. And right. <laughs> the, the, op the more open, the better. <laughs> so yeah, we, Les and I were talking to a, a young lady that wanted to do the queen rearing and, and at the larger scale as well. And that started getting me thinking as well. There's a lot of breeders that are uh, selling treatment-free queens and they're doing the grafting and they're doing, you know, oh, they've got this favorite uh, hives that they're breeding from. And But to me, logically, to your point, it doesn't make sense in a way that, first of all, grafting not necessarily the best to get the best queens. Second, you're, you're pulling out from the same genetic line every time. So in, in, in there's no silver bullet, by the way. Mm -mm, uh, there's mm -mm. no super queen that's going to work nope. for everybody. <laughs> Every beekeeping is hyper local. And the best queens are always going to be the ones that are reared by your colonies because that's they know it. best how to do that in mm -hmm. the circumstances of swarm cells or potentially supersede your cells because they are meaning to bring those queens to life and they're taking the best care of them. So I, I'm actually also in the, the queen rearing course. I just haven't been able to really kind of jump in. So I'm getting all the emails afterwards and the, the things. But for those of you who are interested is uh, Ange Roll and she works with Sam Comfort. They designed a really great program for queen rearing basically in your backyard uh, with Comfort Hives and, and um, they are at theykeepbees.com. So that's another good source of uh, information. So I really like this. And I think everybody should rear their own bee, their own queens in mm -hmm. their own backyards because they're going to be the best ones in the end adapted to their, their cycles. I, do, I have one more question because I really am dying to ask you. Everybody is a buzz always about the mites. What <laughs> it is that you do about this? How do you uh, troubleshoot when you have, you think, issues with mites? So this is a loaded topic it and <laughs> I have to say it's the topic that I least enjoy talking about, but I'm oh, glad you sorry. brought it up. It's totally okay. Um, but it's just because people are very uh, zealous about their feelings about this. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that people sort of join a camp of like this and that. And believe me, I understand. I'm an organic farmer. My husband uh, works for Oregon Tilth and inspects farms to be organic. So we have been, you know, bearing the burden of the, you know, uh, the, you know, name of organic for a long time and sort of understanding that we are in a camp in regards to that topic. Right. So when I first got into bees, I just assumed, you know, treatment free or treatment of course I'm in the treatment free group, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I have studied all different ways. And in the beginning for the first three years, I was completely treatment free. Um, I was able to build up my apiary really big um, from one swarm to in two years, two seasons. Um, on the third season, I came out a winner with uh, 30 hives. So oh, okay. I was able to, you know, use the increase method and really build up really quickly. Um, and then I started catching swarms in town. <laughs> And that was sort of the knell in coffin for me is because I brought home basically a lot of virus and um, mites. And so then that same year, I basically lost everything in one season. Okay. And um, okay. so that was a big, um, you know, a big sort of um, kick in the gut for me, um, because I was pretty zealous up until that point about, you know, never treating for mites and this and that and the other. And um, and now basically I kind of have two things going on. I tend to have a small um, apiary that has my breeder queens mm -hmm. and all of my alternative hives, my top bars and my worries. And those are treatment free. And what I've found is, is that because they are building with the natural comb and because they are able to stay in very tight knit little clusters and um, work with that, that they often don't require um, treatment. They can do really good. That's not to say I don't lose big time on those sometimes, I do. But I have basically a, a level of 
what kind of props I'm willing to give them. And I'm not going to treat, treat, treat to keep one hive alive. I'm just not, you can't keep them all alive. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. So for me, I have a moderate approach. I basically, for all the other, for my Langstroths, I realized that that specific hive type is developed for high collaboration, Mm -hmm. which means they need a lot of my work to keep them healthy and safe in those hives. Mm -hmm. And even running, I, uh, most of my brood boxes are all foundationless. And so they have, you know, a lot of natural comb in there. Um, It's just the overall setup of it they are more prone to things like um, diseases and issues. And so I do one treatment in the fall of oxalic acid and that's it. And then I do um, cultural methods of IPM in the spring, which is everybody who's overwintered gets split, um, which creates a brood break. And then, producing tons of biodiverse forage for them so that they can heal themselves with lots of biodiverse pollen and nectar. And so that's my thing. And I get a lot of, it's funny because a lot of the treatment free beekeepers are like, oh, you treat. And I'm like, yeah, I do. I do. It's a a really strong conversation. I do treat, but I feel that oxalic acid of all the studies I've done Um, As an herbalist, um, it's really interesting to note that oxalic acid and formic acid are both considered medicines in nature, and it's all in the sort of venom mysteries of the world. It's produced by nettles, nettle sting, ant bites, snake venom. That's all formic acid. And uh, Rudolf Steiner, the father of biodynamic farming, gave lectures in 1932 to the World's Fair and said that if industrial beekeeping was to keep on in the direction that they were going, that formic acid would be one of the only things that would save us as a building block of nature to get us to the other side of this conundrum that we found ourselves in. And for me, I have done incredible amount of testing. I'm a um, flagship farm for the Oregon Bee Project. And we've not ever found any residue of it in the comb or in the honey at all. And so I feel totally fine. It's obviously not ever used when the supers are on anyway, Mm -hmm. but um, I find it to be very effective and um, it's only the one treatment. So I have these like, you know, treatment free beekeepers who are like, oh, you're a treater, but then when I go to my club, the people yeah. that are the treatment beekeepers, they think that I'm like crazy because I only do the one treatment, right? Mm-hmm. And so you kind of can't win, um, but I'm following the bees. And what I found was, is that, um, you know, I don't, I, I want people to have my nukes that are going to find their own way. And so that's what is so important to me to produce nukes that are treatment free so that people can choose their own way. Um, And so that's the dedication I have to that. I don't want to fill my students up with just what I believe. I want you to find your own way um, and have all the options and all the information to make informed decisions. Um, But ultimately, um, I set my parameters at a threshold of what I'm okay with. And for me, um, it was really about, you know, taking care of this creature. And for me um, in the Langstroth hive, that does work for me to have um, treatments used. And so I do use the oxalic acid once a year um, and then my cultural practices in the spring. Well, I appreciate your uh, forwardness and uh, answering the question that I apologize was uh, probably pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> you said that was uh, that was a loaded question. So, um, but I really appreciate your candid answer and and uh, kind of explaining your philosophy on that. To your point, um, having uh, I always tell our students that if you start with uh, treatment free bees, you whether you treat or not, you're going to start with the best bees, right? That's so right. they're going to be the most resilient. So uh, I mean, in the end, people keep bees the way they want to. Everybody is uh, trying to keep them alive and healthy. We had a conversation with James in one of the past natural beekeeping corners where we were talking about that middle ground and that practicality, and it's all based on different people's philosophies and goals. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, if that works for you, then that's, that's actually what works, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with that, I really appreciate it. You gave us a whole lot of information on um, brood dynamics and how to stay connected and collaborate with the superorganism so that uh, we can be respectful and, and uh, have the best uh, levels of success in uh, doing natural beekeeping and, and mostly focused on the, the, the biology of the bee. So thank you very much. I want to tell everybody to go and check out the uh, Queen Sun, uh, no, Sun Queen School of Apiary Arts, which is your bee school. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend hiring uh, Fanta for your club uh, to come and speak. And, and she's got fantastic presentations. And uh, when we brought her in, uh, in our past um, bee meetings in, in um, World Bee Day, she was, she ended up with a huge following in Texas, for example, <laughs> which is funny since you're in Oregon, but yeah. that, that speaks to the level, of, to the quality of her presentations and the depth of her uh, knowledge and uh, the pertinence of her philosophy about bees. So it's, it's a highly recommended um, speaker. She's a highly recommended speaker as far as we're concerned. So thank you so much, Fanta, for taking the thank time you. to talk to us. It's thank amazingly... Uh, interesting to always listen to you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so much. This Hive Jive production was made possible by amazing patrons like you, and we appreciate your support. To all our Hive Jive junkies out there, you truly are the bee's knees. <laughs>